say welcome to new listeners and welcome back if you've been here before. Our story in focus this week concerns German officials that have now reached an agreement with Nigerian representatives to return a portion of the artifacts known as Benin bronzes that were stolen during the colonial era. Among other stories, we will also highlight ongoing protests in Colombia, a new basic income scheme in Sudan, a change in how data related to domestic violence is being collected in India, and a sweet story of a very caring husband in Canada. I am your host, Yemi, and every week I bring you overlooked stories from all around the world. As you will notice from this episode, some of the stories include the good, the bad, the random, and the weird. If you come across a story that you think should be on the podcast, just reach out on social media through the link in the show notes. So for this episode, if I sound weird, it's because I'm recovering from a pretty bad food allergy that has essentially made talking and pronouncing words slightly painful. Actually, I'm lying. It's really painful, but the meds are kicking in, so I think we're good to go. With that said, let's get right into the stories for this week. In Colombia, street protests started on Wednesday, April the 28th and has continued until the time of this recording on Sunday, May the 2nd, 2021. Thousands have been marching to demand that the government withdraw its planned tax reform proposal, which, as it is written, leveled sales taxes on public services and some food. Colombia's biggest union put out a call for the protests, and they still expect it to continue sporadically, including on May 19th, despite some modifications being made to the proposal. The controversial tax reform by President Ivan Duke's government could increase taxes on individuals and businesses and eliminate many exemptions. It was originally meant to raise about six billion US dollars, which is equivalent to two percent of the country's gross domestic product. The government had also suggested that it would expand the basket of items that are subject to value added tax. According to the government, the reform is crucial for Colombia to retain its investment-grade debt rating. The protests led to multiple deaths, injuries, arrests, and the destruction of property in multiple cities across the country. The Colombian president has said on Sunday, May 2nd, that he would withdraw the proposed tax reform in total, though he did insist that a reform is still necessary to ensure financial stability. The government had insisted earlier that the policy could in fact not be withdrawn at all, but it would remove some of its most controversial points, including the leveling of sales tax on utilities and some food. The central bank warned last week that a failure to approve that reform would have a negative impact on the economy. However, a loss of the country's investment grade rating has already been priced in by many investors, so they essentially expect it. Lawmakers, unions, and other groups celebrated Sunday's announcements as a victory. German officials have reached an agreement with Nigerian representatives to return a portion of the artifacts known as Benin bronzes that were stolen during the colonial era. In 1897, British soldiers and colonialists looted thousands of plaques and sculptures from the ancient kingdom of Benin which is now southern Nigeria and not the country of Benin Republic. These artifacts were ultimately acquired by museums largely in Europe and the United States. While hundreds of artifacts ended up in the British Museum, hundreds were also sold to other collections such as the Ethnological Museum in Berlin, which has one of the world's largest collections of historical objects from the Kingdom of Benin, estimated to include about 530 items, including 440 bronzes. For the last decade, a consortium known as Benin Dialogue Group has been working to repatriate these works and establish a permanent display in Benin City. The group has worked in partnership with Willen Museums in Germany and other European nations to achieve its goal of returning these artifacts to Benin. The German officials aim to return the first of their Benin bronzes next year and will release more specific plans and timetables by this summer. Notably, Germany has not committed to returning all the artifacts and they have left the door open to keeping some of them. A historian named Jürgen Zimmerer, a professor of global history at the University of Hamburg, welcomed the plans but noted that the plans did not go far enough. He said that it was sad that there is neither a precise time plan nor an unconditional commitment to restitute all the looted artifacts. To add to that, 
He also noted that it's not yet clear how many objects will be returned or whether there will be any recognition of the efforts of the civil society groups that had called for the restitution. Activists are increasingly calling for cultural institutions to repatriate their Benin bronzes, which are widely seen as a symbol of colonial conquest, to their country of origin, Nigeria, though few have actually done so. According to media reports, the British Museum does not currently have plans to return part of its collection. In the case of Germany, the next step will be to develop a roadmap for the return, which should be completed within the next few months. That will mean inventorying all the items by June 15th, followed by a meeting on June 29th to consider the best approach. The next meeting of the Benin Dialogue Group is set for May the 27th, 2021. In Sudan, millions are currently struggling through an economic crisis that has deepened as Sudan tries to emerge from decades of isolation and conflict. According to Statistica, from 2019 to 2020 alone, inflation, which measures the broad increase in price levels, rose by 142%. Sudan has also seen double-digit inflation growth in every year for the last decade. According to Reuters, there is now a shortage of everything from power to medicines. The government is now introducing a donor-funded scheme that aims to provide a temporary $5 basic monthly income to 80% of its population of 43 million. As at the time of this recording, a dollar, and by a dollar I mean a US dollar, was equivalent to about 380 Sudanese pounds, which brings the monthly income to about 1,800 Sudanese pounds per person. According to data from a number of websites, this amount should be able to provide for food for a family of four with just the bare necessities for about a month. The rollout, which started in February, is a test for the current transitional civilian military partnership that is due to govern Sudan until 2023. According to reports, many Sudanese have not seen the benefits of the uprising that overthrew former President Omar al-Bashir two years ago. The uprising at the time was triggered by the deteriorating economy, and the economy has not significantly improved. The family support program came about as the government pursues an aggressive economic reform program monitored by the International Monetary Fund. Sudan is also hoping to win relief from at least 50 billion US dollars in debt and access to funding from international lenders. Sudan has received 820 million US dollars from the World Bank and the donor countries from the program's first two phases, which aims to cover 24 million people in 12 states for six months. The program is not yet funded to reach the rest of the population or for a potential extension of payments into next year. Each year, an estimated 12 million girls who are under 18 years of age are forced or coerced to marry against their will. This means that there are currently more than 650 million women and girls worldwide who married as children. This is a global problem. And while more prevalent in developing countries, the problem persists even in developed countries that are vocal advocates against the practice, such as Canada and the United States. This particular story hones in on India, where estimates from UNICEF suggest that each year, at least 1.5 million girls under 18 get married. This is the largest incidence of child marriage in the world. In a new development, India's biggest survey of domestic violence is now going to exclude girls that were married before the age of 18 due to a new child protection law, even after a previous report found that nearly one in six married girls aged 15 to 19 had faced abuse. This means that those who are already victims of child marriage will essentially lose their voice when it comes to domestic abuse. Activists have also highlighted that this potentially buries the problem of domestic abuse in these circumstances, which would in fact make it worse for these girls to get any help. They also believe that it would distort the statistics by showing a drop in domestic abuse cases. What gets measured has, at the very least, the potential to get managed. And India's National Health Survey is a mine of statistics on key social indicators that is then used to craft government policies and pinpoint charity spending. Some statistics captured in the survey include fertility rates, immunization, marriage age, and gender-based violence. India began asking questions about domestic abuse as part of the National Health Survey in the year 2005-2006, after the country's Domestic Violence Act was passed. 
Since then, activists have used the results from the survey in their campaigns and to provide education on the issues. Officials have said that they dropped the under-18 age group because the survey's confidentiality clause was at odds with India's Child Protection Law of 2012, which demands that all cases of child sex abuse must be reported to the police. S.K. Singh, a professor at the International Institute of Population Sciences, which conducts the survey, said that they had no choice but to exclude under-18s from future interviews in light of the new child protection rules. Campaigners like Indira Pancholi, founder of women rights nonprofits Mahila Jan Adhika Samiti in Rajasthan, have said that the girls will have no voice and dropping the data is a mistake. Let's bring it home in our last story for this week. In Alberta, Canada, a caring 79-year-old man went to a beauty school called Delma College to learn how to do his wife's hair and makeup. According to the director of the school, her appearance has always been something she has taken pride in, and it's important to her, so therefore, it was important to him. Unfortunately, due to failing eyesight, it became increasingly difficult for her to do her hair and makeup herself. The husband, who has chosen to remain anonymous, wanted to first learn how to do his wife's hair because she kept burning herself with a curling wand. The husband's love for his wife of 50 years touched staff and students of the beauty school and had them in tears. Hannah, the school's director, also told media outlets that he lovingly pulled pictures from his wallet, showing everybody his wife and boasting just about how beautiful she has always been and how talented she was with her skill set of typing over 100 words a minute when she was working. Since his lessons, both the husband and the wife have visited the beauty school again just to thank everyone for their help. I typically like to end the episode on a relatively positive note, and the last story was really sweet. Thank you for bearing with me. I know I probably sounded really weird, and I really want to appreciate you for sticking with me through this episode. So that is all for this week. Have a great week and stay golden. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to tune in every week for a new episode. Overlooked is a Tunica Media production, which also includes shows like Africa in My Kitchen with more on the way. So follow Tunica Media on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to be in the loop. Until next time, have yourself a great week ahead.